Um, my name is Manny Scher, and I'm uh, one of the directors of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in London. It's an old organization um, with its origins um, in the Second World War, um, and we're concerned with um, uh, broad social issues but, uh, through activities involving research and consultancy, uh, organizational development and change consultancy, that is. Um, uh, we work primarily in the public sector, and, um, but, but not, not exclusively, and also primarily in the UK, but not exclusively. We have strong connections with Europe and the rest of the world. My background is as a psychoanalyst, and um, I bring that uh, perspective, those perspectives, to bear on the work that I do with uh, large, complex organizations. And I'll be talking tonight about some of those, exa uh, bringing examples of my work um, where um, um, uh, mental health issues are, are central uh, to, the, um, to the organizations concerned. Um, um, I place a lot of uh, importance on group work, uh, the nature of groups since they are regarded as the kind of uh, building blocks of organizations. While uh, individuals are important, of course, but it's groups and how they work together, how they relate uh, internally as groups and how they relate uh, with other groups inside their organizations is the uh, central um, focus of our study, investigations and uh, consulting for change. Thank you for your welcome. I'm delighted to be here. It's a real privilege. Um, <coughs> uh, I have to confess, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I'm South African by birth and I arrived in the UK 46 years ago. This is my first visit across the border. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as you would expect, you know, there was a pull in the opposite direction. But, um, but I'm glad I'm here. I'm sorry it's at such a sad time. Um, and, um, but uh, I, I, sh I share uh, your f feelings of uh, horror and sadness at what's occurred here on Friday. So, um, I also had a look at the, the list of attendees tonight. And I see that you actually um, constitute a very interesting spread of organizations, representatives of organizations and roles. Um, I, well, I imagine uh, different roles. Um, so what I'm going to say tonight, I hope will interest some of you, um, um, or bits of what I say will interest you more than other bits, more likely. Uh, because it's um, a quite a, a, a wide-ranging uh, conversation I want to have with you on <coughs> something that's kind of bothered me <coughs> with <coughs> recently in the <coughs> a number of organizations that I've been consulting to. And um, I'll, I'll explain a little more about them in, in some detail. But because of reasons of confidentiality, um, I, I won't be giving too many details away, or even the names of the organizations. Um, but I hope to say enough to be able to illustrate the points I want to make about what happens to people in particular types of organizations, particularly organizations where <coughs> uh, civil liberties are restricted. So that would be for instance, uh, uh, prisons, um, people in the, in the criminal justice system, psychiatric hospitals, uh, ordinary hospitals even. You know, if you go in as a patient, you kind of lose something of your freedom <coughs> as you take up a patient role. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to pay attention to my throat. <coughs> <clears throat> and um, 
so, so assignments that I and colleagues have been involved in usually um, last anything between six months and three years, sometimes longer, uh, because, as we know, change is a very slow process. And uh, I'm going to be speaking some, uh, about that um, to, uh, a bit. <coughs> um, I'm also interested <coughs> in some of the core theories that uh, grew up as a result of the practice of the Tavistock Institute over many decades. We've, we've been around a long time. It's, it's, we were officially incorporated in 1947, uh, but we were around before that for about 30 years in, uh, under some other guise. So we are actually, as an institution, uh, um, a product of the First World War, which, uh, and it was given more of a, an impetus uh, during the Second World War. And then when the health service came into existence, um, this thing you called the Tavistock, uh, which, ah, oh, thanks, brilliant. <coughs> but I can't have this at the same time as speak, can I? <laughs> 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 so by, by 1947, there was a, um, a, a, um, a significant clinical establishment called the Tavistock Clinic, and in it there were some non-clinical departments, research, um, evaluation, um, uh, consultancy, and so forth. The non-clinical departments came together to form the Tavistock Institute, and all the clinical departments joined the NHS. But we stayed in the same building until 1993, so, so about 20 years ago, the Tavistock Institute moved out and became um, uh, an independent, a standalone organization. So we had actually, uh, um, uh, we have charitable status and um, our primary business is research and consulting and publishing. <coughs> so what I came across in, in the last four major consultancies that I've been in, involved in was the social dimension of mental illness and the role it plays for and on behalf of the individual concerned, the staff who are responsible for them, and for society. And the role that mental illness plays in defending against imagination. That was the title of my uh, talk. Um, <coughs> <coughs> and it, when I say imagination, I mean um, the policy makers and the leaders of organizations who have to think imaginatively about how they structure their organizations, how they deliver what they uh, say they do um, in the best way possible for the, the, the groups of people they're meant to be assisting. <coughs> <coughs> so I currently work with uh, several public service organizations which have these large concerns about mental health issues in the population groups they serve. <coughs> and I'll illustrate my talk with examples of institutionally induced madness that should make policymakers and organizational leaders rethink the kinds of structures they create for others to work in and where the work itself is difficult or traumatic. Such work, I argue, requires containing supports to protect both staff and service users against inhumane conditions, living or working conditions. I will talk from the proposition that all work generates anxiety. All work. <coughs> Even <coughs> if it's at the level of anxiety about failing in the work that you're doing but some work generates more anxiety than others. <coughs> and that the people involved in the work, strategists, leaders, managers, frontline staff, generate personal and institutional defenses to cope with that anxiety. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
the nature of those defences and their construction and their management will ultimately influence how staff manage their own and their team's anxieties. In many cases, the need to manage this anxiety is ignored, sadly. And where that happens, the team and the institution generally are dysfunctional, serving neither the patient or the client or the customer, whatever one calls them, <clears throat> nor the staff, who may experience high levels of stress, burnout, illness, or leave the job altogether. <coughs> I'll try, I'll try, thanks. <coughs> A second proposition from which I shall speak is that in most public service organisations, the primary task which is meant to guide the strategies, the policies and the practices of the staff is usually unclear and may even be confounded by having a second primary task, often unconscious, for example, in the health service, the primary task of treatment and cure, of care and compassion, may be overtaken by a value for money, cost-effectiveness primary task. That becomes the primary task. That is, the introduction of a target culture that may reduce the quality of care and compassion and demoralizes staff, making them do things that conflict with their professionalism, their values and their desire to serve. A third proposition is that mental health problems are usually linked to the complexities inherent in a system whose working task is based on a double task. And the, the double task is a concept I want to introduce you to. So the double task may comprise, say, the primary task of diagnosis, treatment, or detention if it's a prison, um, imprisonment, or um, w warfare in the case of military uh, institutions. And these, I'm mentioning this list because those are the institutions I'm currently working with. <coughs> so the, prim the primary task which the organization is there to do may conflict with the second task of a duty of care towards the population group detained and respecting their dignity and human rights. This contradiction and conflict in the double task is demonstrated by the following statements from one of the organizations I'm working with. So here is a statement from a senior manager. Quote, we have a duty of care, but mental health issues are secondary to our primary task. In many instances, we are able to identify mental health issues early and clearly. Our job is detention. But there is a group of people in the middle who are not so ill as to be sectioned. And it is with this group that we have often lost our cases in court. Then, from a frontline worker working with people in detention, Reasons for detention are not well defined. We pay special attention where there is high risk of harm to the public. The spectrum of risk makes it difficult to arrive at satisfactory decisions. Sometimes there are conflicting positions that complicate matters for us. We have to be risk averse when it comes to public safety. And then from an interview with a detainee. The following is an example of a theme that very strongly emerged in the number of interviews we had with them. Staff need to recognize what people tell them, regardless of whether it's true or false. Strange statement, but this was a, a kind of cultural artifact that people are not believed, generally speaking. We are locked up, and this is difficult for vulnerable people. 
It's like a prison here. Either we have served our sentences or we should be sent to a real prison. Why are ill people here? Everyone here has their stories. But what brings us together are our experiences that this feels like a prison. We are treated as prisoners, but we are not prisoners. Staff back each other up instead of providing care. As prisoners, we are helpless and vulnerable. So you get a sense of how desperate um, certain um, situations are inside organizations for the people in them, and the staff as well. <clears throat> the relationships between policy makers, managers and frontline staff, healthcare staff and case workers can be characterized by intense pre uh, processes of mutual blame and defensiveness. For example, healthcare, these are the people who provide you know, the healthcare services inside these large um, detaining type institutions. Um, healthcare is blamed by the detention staff for not responding to their referrals quickly enough. Detention staff are blamed by the healthcare staff for not using their common sense when making referrals to the, to the healthcare that leads to the facilities being overwhelmed with numerous un unnecessary referrals. <coughs> These two groups, the detention people, uh, those are the usually the big tough guys, um, and the healthcare people, they use each other to export, in inverted commas, <coughs> and import wrongdoing and failure into each other. By this we mean that each group carries one element of the contradictory double task. Am, am, I, am I clear? Are you, yeah, you understand what I'm saying? Consequently, detention, <coughs> <coughs> detention staff work at preventing escape, whereas healthcare staff are focused on the overall physical and psychological needs of the detainees. And these two groups are often engaged in a kind of cold war with each other. <coughs> with the net result that the detainees uh, are caught between the two and suffer. This splitting of the task is detrimental <coughs> to the overall efficiency of services where mental health is an issue. It results in mutual blaming processes and collusive relationships in which the different parts of the total system engage adversely with each other. The reason for this split is to protect the staff from the potentially overwhelming psychologically and emotionally distressing traumas of their charges. As a result of this, groups under pressure use these defensive mechanisms to protect themselves from feelings of helplessness and hopelessness by placing responsibilities onto other groups in the system. An alternative would be to think imaginatively together in joint meetings on how interdisciplinary relationships can best be used for the benefits of their charges. It's my contention, it's ours at, in my colleagues at the Tavistock, that these dynamic processes of blame and recrimination get replicated throughout the system. There are similar systemic dynamics operating in the relationship between the relevant higher level department. By higher level department, I mean you know, a government civil service department and the NGO sector, the non-governmental organization sector. 
with mutual projections of hostility and mistrust between voluntary organizations, special interest groups and charities on the one hand and the civil service on the other. Responsibility for resolving these complex inter-organizational difficulties is often left to the private sector. The unspoken wish or hope is that subcontractors and private sector agencies would more easily resolve these dynamic tensions. <clears throat> In my view, that is a vain hope because privatization is meant to stimulate competition, not collaboration. That's the stated objective of you know, the privatization policies. <clears throat> so, I'm going to become a little theoretical now because um, I do believe we all work with our own personal th theories theories in our in our heads when we when we work even if we cross the road you've got a theory of how to cross the road <coughs> um, they help me they help my colleagues I hope that you'll find them useful too <coughs> the four domains that I've referred to in this paper are the military prisons and the National Health Service the National Health Service psychiatric services and services for victims of sexual violence. In our work, we rely on what we call theories in use and we, help, uh, we hope that, the, uh, that that help throw light on the reasons why the, uh, there are high levels of mental health problems in the services and the difficulties of taking imaginative and effective measures to reduce them. So I'll run through very briefly, and I hope that this isn't uh, over simplifying th things for you. Um, but, but time means we have to rush through them. Organizational theory is one useful theory to have in one's pocket. Organizational theory describes the structures, the tasks, the attitudes, experiences, practices, beliefs and values, personal and cultural, of an organization. It is the specific collection of values and norms that are shared by people and groups in an organization that control the way they interact with each other <coughs> and with the stakeholders outside the organization. Organizational values are the beliefs and ideas about the kinds of goals members of the organization pursue and ideas about the appropriate standards of behavior <coughs> that organizational members use to achieve their goals. From organizational values develop organizational norms, guidelines or expectations that prescribe appropriate kinds of behavior by employees in particular situations and control the behavior of organizational members towards one another. A strong culture exists where staff respond to work because of their alignment to organizational values. Strong cultures help, organizational, help organizations operate with outstanding execution. A weak culture results from poor alignment with organizational values and control must be exercised through extensive procedures and bureaucracy. Where culture is strong, people do things because they believe it's the right thing to do. You don't have to measure them all the time. <coughs> strong cultures... <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. Strong cultures also produce quick and easy ways to refer to a mode of thinking that people engage when they are deeply involved in a cohesive in-group. If you've got tight, well-knit teams of people who know what they have to do and enjoy doing it, they get on and do it. 
In authoritarian cultures, people do not challenge organizational thinking. And therefore, there is a reduced capacity for innovative and imaginative ideas. This occurs when, where there is heavy reliance on a central authority in an organization. And of course, that describes the nature of hierarchical um, civil service types of departments. People who challenge standard practices are seen as negative influences because their ideas bring conflict. Organizations need individuals to challenge the status quo, whether it is groupthink or bureaucracy. Otherwise, imagination is repressed and new ideas are difficult to develop and implement effectively. In the context of statutory organizations, the questions that stem from organizational theory might be, how well do the values and practices, say, of the outsourced companies align with the government department's values? It's hard sometimes to see that alignment. To what extent do prison offices and healthcare staff share similar objectives, attitudes and norms towards the management of prisoners' cases? How are the tensions that are generated by the primary task of detention, imprisonment, psychiatric inpatient care, or military service, and the secondary task, I spoke about earlier, of duty of care managed by that organization's different staff groups? An overriding question would be whether the sometimes competing cultures in detention centers, in prisons and hospitals, and the central administration, cause detainees or patients to become psychiatrically ill, to become psychiatrically ill, to cause people to go crazy, contribute to existing mental health conditions, some people come into the system already vulnerable, or makes no difference. So these are areas for research uh, to, uh, to consider. The next major theory I want to talk about is socio-technical systems. Um, are you familiar with that? Just not a show of hands? No? Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a theory which came out of the work of the Tavistock also some years ago. And there's shortly be a book coming out um, uh, about it, another one. Um, following a colloquium in September at Oxford University on revisiting social systems, socio-technical systems theory. It's a very useful one, I find. That's why I want to share it with you. But it's one which often um, fades out of sight. Um, you know, the, 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 all theories have their you know, up moments when they're very popular and then they fade out of sight. <coughs> Much of contemporary scientific management subordinates the human element to technological imperatives. Does that you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that we have to adapt to the technology rather than the technology adapt to people. The concept of, of the socio-technical system jointly optimizes all variables in the organization and thus the possibility of increasing choice. Socio-technical systems theory shifts attention from the individual to work groups and the wider organization as a whole. The theory emphasizes the interrelatedness of technical and socio-psychological factors in work alongside political and economic factors. It takes account of almost everything. Socio-technical systems the, the socio-technical systems concept questions the salience of technology as determining social, political and other relationships within organizations. As a result, organizational choice increases since it is possible to design forms of work organization that optimize the best fit for these factors. <coughs> One consequence of the socio-technical approach to organizational design has been the emergence of the concept of semi-autonomous work groups. The corollary to this idea 
is that every individual who takes up a role in a work group and by extension in an organization is called upon to manage themselves in role. <coughs> this is done in two ways. <coughs> Excuse me. This is uh, by managing oneself in relation to one's work tasks and activities and by managing relationships with other role holders. Two important aspects of the um, socio-technical systems idea. <coughs> so in relation to mental health issues in the statutory organization services, the questions that socio-technical systems might ask or address are Firstly, structural. How integrated in practice are the different departments, units, sections in the overarching authority? How coordinated are these units with its partner organizations like health and, so, and the criminal justice system and outsourced commercial companies that provide services on behalf of the higher level organization? Professional. How collaborative are the different professions that provide psychiatric and physical health services for detainees or prisoners or military personnel on behalf of the higher level departments? <coughs> and the, thirdly, the psychological. How well are the causes and effects of mental ill health understood and practiced by staff within these organizations and their associated organizations? like health, the police, the courts, and so on. Is mental illness located in individuals only? Or can mental health problems be caused, in inverted commas, and spread, in inverted commas, by the social situations that people are in? Now, I, I understand I'm talking very generally here, and I'll be coming to some examples shortly. Um, to illustrate this. But overall, everyone agrees that being incarcerated is detrimental to your mental health. <coughs> the, the fact of being in, incarcerated um, with, with an uncertain future um, isn't good for one. <coughs> so, moving on to the next cluster, linked to socio-technical systems theory is the concept of Social systems as a defense against anxiety. This, uh, I can see some heads nodding, but they are s this is a crucial central concept in the way in which we understand organizations. This construct, social systems as a defense against anxiety, postulates that in order to avoid the anxieties aroused by the work of the organization, people develop defenses to avoid psychological involvement with patients or prisoners, clients, their charges, even teachers and children in the classroom. These defenses include the idea that professionals are interchangeable. All should look the same, wearing uniforms to avoid individual, uh, individualized appearance, and should be willing to move to work uh, in different workplaces at short notice. The nursing profession is a case in point. <coughs> Breaking down tasks into a series of mundane routines that can be repeated with many people. Example, one professional performing the same task on different people, another professional performing a different task with the same people. Rather than each professional extending in-depth care with one person. Now, if that's so obvious, why do why do uh, why is work why are work arrangements structured in such a way <coughs> that um, staff are prevented from engaging relationship-wise with a limited number of individuals? The answer is it's cheaper. It's cheaper. It's, um, it sometimes gives the illusion of being more efficient. But, uh, but the, the primary motive is um, 
you get through more people, you get them through the system more quickly in shorter time and so on. <coughs> Another feature of, um, uh, of these defenses is avoiding expression of individual initiative or decision making by making all professional and administrative tasks prescribed from above. And another final one is discouraging expression of emotion or interest in individual patients or prisoners or charges and so forth. And we know <coughs> that the most effective way of limiting um, the extent of mental illness is to engage in relationships. It's not... Um, so these defenses are aimed at reducing anxiety aroused by intimate physical and emotional involvement with ill patients, with clients, with children, with the charges in our care. These social defenses are not the result of individual personalities of the professional, <coughs> but embedded in the culture and routines of the organization and woven into the professional identity and practices of the staff in their training programs. They are taught not to feel. Ultimately, these defenses are ineffective because staff are still subject to the difficult emotional demands of the work as they become disengaged from their patients or charges. This means that they are not able to effectively engage with the causes of their anxiety. By not being able to think and acknowledge the impact of their work, they are not able to learn from their experiences or to work through feelings of loss, he helplessness or guilt. This results in many talented professionals and workers not engaging emotionally with their charges and thus unconsciously allowing the growing mental health issues to prevail. So questions that the theory of social systems as a defense a defense against anxiety raise are, does the type of professional training for detention center staff, healthcare staff, military personnel and case workers encourage initiative or unthinkingly lead them to perform routine tasks and keep relationships with detainees at a superficial level? What are the unspoken anxieties in organizations where these people are held? or located. What might be the consequences of these anxieties for how people work together? What social defenses does the higher level department have that stop people thinking clearly about the difficult feelings that people experience at work? Do these defenses work? Well, you know my answer to that. <coughs> but the higher level organization anxieties <coughs> are often divorced from the practitioners on the ground because at the higher level organization, the civil service department, the anxieties are political. Will we be uh, re-elected? <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry about all this coughing. <coughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to weave in here, uh, uh, you know, something on the theoretical side with something from the, the practical uh, stuff that I'm finding in the work with these organizations. So the next theory is system psychodynamics theory. This is an interdisciplinary field comprising three fields of study, psychoanalysis, group relations, and the concept of task and boundary within open systems perspectives. System psychodynamics has its intellectual foundations in the Tavistock method of working experientially with groups and the study of organizations. System psychodynamics is the term used to refer to the collective psychological behavior within and between groups and organizations. <coughs> System psychodynamics theory and practice provides a way of thinking about energizing or motivating forces resulting from the interconnection between various groups and subunits 
of a social system. The theory focuses on the challenges of crossing boundaries and how unconscious factors affect leadership, efforts, learning, productivity, communication and social change. So it covers almost you know, the whole field. So questions covered by this theory might include how well do the various groups, centers where people are held, subdivisions and categories within the higher level department, the various stakeholders outside it within the UK and internationally, understand the meaning of mental illness for the people who are designated ill and for the public. In other words, the public also has a view about what mental uh, illness is and what it deems should be done with it. Mostly it's keep it away from us. How well do they integrate their efforts to address the problems of psychiatric patients, immigrants, prisoners, returning military personnel? How well is the construct of crossing psychological boundaries understood in relation between mental illness and mental health? In crossing organizational boundaries, in, uh, how well is this understood in crossing organizational boundaries, in interdepartmental relationships, in crossing sector boundaries between a government department and its outsourced providers, in crossing international boundaries in the international context of immigrants wishing to land in the UK? <coughs> how are we doing for time and that? I haven't been watching. Um, yes, and we've got until uh, we started. So we're running out of time, I think. 10, 15 minutes. Okay. All right. So I think I'm um, obviously need to move on. <coughs> boundaries. Um, I, I'm going to say something about boundaries. Organizational theories emphasize the significance of the boundary that separates the organization from its environment, one division from another, and people from the roles they play. A system imports resources and information across its boundary, transforms them into useful products or services, and then exports them across the boundary <coughs> to customers and clients. The boundary separates the outer world of opportunities and challenges from the inner world of work and transformation. Without a well-managed boundary, each unit in an organization will respond in its own way to the environment so that relationships within the organization will be as unpredictable as the environment it is in. <coughs> Leadership plays an important part, then, in managing boundaries. By standing at the boundary, leadership creates a more controllable world in which activities within the boundary are relatively predictable and organized. The boundary region separates certainty from a broader region of uncertainty. This is the task of management. When boundaries are poorly designed and managed, they cause considerable stress and anxiety. This happens when leaders cannot influence management and management cannot influence the frontline staff. In turn, frontline staff, unable to influence the people on whom they depend, cannot reduce the uncertainty they face when doing their work, resulting in feelings of alienation and unhappiness. So, what I'm saying might sound pretty obvious to you. Um, and it's pretty obvious when we speak about this to our clients in these organizations. The facts are known. Many previous reviews and reports and investigations have been conducted in the organizations. And they all come up with the same conclusions and the same recommendations. So what's the problem? about implementing recommendations. Why is implementation so problematic? <clears throat> and that's the question. It, it's not about what do we have to do. People know what they have to do. 
From our reading of past reviews of services that we have worked with, we've seen many sensible ideas about the care of mentally ill people under their control being suggested. However, implementing them was difficult, if not impossible, because of the dominating cultural influences and the organization of the work. Implementing recommendations requires serious internal work within the management system. <coughs> and one of the reasons why implementation is so difficult is about understanding the processes of grief. Our observations based on working with organizations where liberty is restricted is that not enough recognition is made of the psychological impact of detention. In these situations, people, whether they are deemed mentally ill or not, suffer from feelings of loss. A vast body of psychological literature informs us that loss is experienced as bereavement within ensuing grief. Unresolved mourning and grief plays a significant role in the etiology of mental ill health. People whose liberty has been curtailed experience some form of the following symptoms. Shock, sadness, crying, changes in life roles and responsibilities, fears about the future, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, anxiety, loneliness, confusion and yearning. The normal stages that people go through who have suffered a major shock uh, a major loss are shock, protest, disorganization, and reorganization. After a significant loss, many people have a sense they are going crazy, particularly if they have not sustained a major loss before. Though people experience phases of grief, they are not helpless victims. There are emotional tasks which a person can actually work through following the death of someone close, a divorce, or been victimized through abuse. <coughs> and there are four phases in this grieving process. And I'm stating these because it's important for managers of these institutions to have this kind of structure in their minds and facilitate their um, um, uh, staff um, to, in, to facilitate their charges to work through these phases. Shock versus reality. The task of this stage is to accept the reality of the loss. The life you have had maybe is over and will not return versus a denial and an unbelief of the loss. Protest versus experience. The task is to experience the pain of grief rather than suppress or avoid it. One needs to face the pain of loss, feel the pain, and express the grief rather than run away from it. <coughs> All people who are detained or are aggressed are emotionally troubled. The more fragile ones are more likely to tip over into florid mental illness. A consequence of this is that staff need training in the assessment of the likelihood of detainees breaking down. <coughs> With all the organizations I have worked, the assessment process when being detained needs to be improved. More psychiatric oversight at the start of the detention process would help. Better information on, on, on the detainees' histories would inform the assessment process. In many instances, it is said it was told to us, that if detainees' histories w w had been known at the time of, de of, of detention, they would not have been detained. So large numbers of people are in detention who shouldn't actually be there. All seem to agree that detention is definitely harmful to mental health. It would seem that mental health care is inadequate from reception onwards, and staff seem inadequately trained in assessing risk of self-harm, for instance. To improve this would require in-depth screening 
staff training, more registered mental nurses, more use of interpreters, and doctors trained to make a proper mental health assessment. It's not all doctors uh, are trained to that level. <coughs> Okay, I'll, um, I think I'll end with a five. Um, because I, what I am often asked uh, when we do this kind of consultation uh, is, uh, and so what should we be doing? So here's a list of <laughs> some things we should be doing. <coughs> um, from these ideas, I hope, flows a clear requirement for any organization to pay attention to the following aspects of their functioning. Firstly, whilst a major strength of any organization is its business-like image, which conveys a sense of paternalistic protectiveness, this can be sometimes rather uh, recessive. We believe that whilst it is essential not to downgrade the organization's masculine characteristics, it's important in shaping the future to add a more feminine emphasis like listening, understanding, nurturing, promoting, integrating, sustaining, and so on. Secondly, organizations need to adopt holistic approaches to the individual, their group, the change, and to communications, a holistic approach, and to consider the individual and technology in a linked way. That is, to aim towards integrated socio-technical systems. This is highly motivating to people and presents an opportunity for organizations to emphasize what are the contemporary and relevant benefits. Thirdly, the defense mechanisms against integrating change policies and communication systems within work-related activities means that people perceive themselves as isolates. It's very common, this. People working on their own little piece of the whole uh, jigsaw, as it were. <laughs> it's easy to metaphorically keep your head down and pretend that the issues do not affect one. There is scope to find ways of fostering integration at a perceptual level and in reality within organizations so that change and communications become more integrated into the work. Fourthly, in all organizations there is a clear need for education, training and development and being aware that in order to work, slow, step-by-step -step organic approaches are required in order to change attitudes and behavior with relevance to work-related thought and activity. I really do want to emphasize the slow, step-by-step -step organic nature of change not revolutionary um, changes that have to take place by tomorrow. Research highlights the importance of individual, departmental and organizational activity which can be used in different ways to generate interest, provide information and to shape the nature of communications as a resource which promotes the organization's general purpose. Personnel everywhere need continuing education in order to enrich work-related communication. Fifthly, f um, there is a need to develop people's knowledge of other parts of the organization and their roles in relation to the other roles, other role holders, in a tangible way. Inductions, joint seminars, study days, conferences, local and international, more social occasions, spontaneous and fo formal, can be fostered. Finally, in terms of the approach to education and training, there is a requirement to provide activities, I think, which are integrated <coughs> with day-to-day -day work rather than removed from it. So, I'm not a great fan of giving lectures. <laughs> These should be carried out in an environment committed to learning, the acquisition of knowledge and skills, so that people believe they have a choice and may be motivated towards participating in the choices um, imaginatively. They can be helped to see that they can use their organizations constructively 
and that they will not be absorbed or trapped by them or denied their creativity so that their organizations would become bad employers. Target-driven services mean that the focus of the service is on the target rather than the person the service is designed to help. And targeting people by their deficits, which is very common, we will, you know, the service will be for the unemployed, or the person's an offender, or a teenage parent, or an illegal immigrant. It's the deficit which gets highlighted. And that in itself is part of the problem. It defines people within their deficits instead of enabling them to develop thriving, sustainable, independent lives. So, in conclusion, <coughs> I want to say that our main point of theoretical importance and relevance for the social systems as a defense against anxiety construct is our understanding of the types of organizations I've been talking about as a projection of the anxieties evoked by the primary task of the organization. For example, coping with the effects of sexual violence or illegal immigration, or warfare. And the failure to contain or process those primary issues and anxieties within that system itself. So for instance, in the military, you know, returning sol soldiers from operations, there are facilities um, run by the MOD, but there's a heavy reliance on um, independent voluntary charities and organizations. Um, so the processing of the horrors of war isn't done internal to the MOD, it's done somewhere else. And that's the thing I'm, I'm critical of. <coughs> um, by accepting these types of organizations within its jurisdiction, so, for instance, um, um, you know, if, we, if, if the health service accepts that there are psychiatric hospitals or sexual violence clinics, by accepting these types of organizations within its jurisdiction, the higher level department must be aware of an inherent risk to the organization of this task, and in particular for the potential for management failures. Now, we've had the, the, the story of the Mid Staffordshire hospitals, you know, it's, 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 that's an example of this writ large. I've set out to demonstrate the relevance of the anxiety thesis and to show how powerfully it explains evolving catastrophic developments in our institutions. We urge a greater focus on the role of unconscious defenses and their enactment. And I've demonstrated that these ideas about social systems as a defense against anxiety capture the meaning of it in beneficial ways. I focused on the particularity of the anxieties that arouse the, defense, the, the specific defenses which are relied on to cope with them, such as suppression, denial, and projection, when working with the consequences of incarceration and the denial of civil liberties upon weak and unprotected members of society. In the case of the services for victims of sexual violence. I've been working with a SARC. You know what SARCs are? Sexual Assault Referral Centers. There's supposed to be one in every major city. Um, um, <coughs> in the case of the services of victims of sexual violence, sexual scapegoating of female patients had got translated unconsciously into sexual scapegoating of the service's all-female leadership and all-female staff. It seemed that women had to be made victims socially, institutionally and individually. So this paper has more obviously central theoretical purposes and tries to set out its understanding in a way that might help all the parties in an institution or organization better understand what happens in their institutions. In the events that unfold, it should be important to downplay the implications of blame, even if blame is sometimes uh, seems to be justified. And this is a great shame. You know, there's so much um, control 
uh, is exerted by relying on blaming. We need to acknowledge that inevitably partisan feelings do get stimulated in an environment of acts of violence, restraint and injustice as a consequence of the emotions which this work involves. But we need to try to get beyond these and to try to understand the situation and its passions as a whole, explaining what is happening to everyone involved. An element of critique can hardly be avoided, but our emphasis should be upon understanding the unconscious effects of working in situations of violence, detention and retribution. Thank you. Uh, people are resilient, it's absolutely true. Um, and they will work, uh, find ways of working uh, constructively when they're in difficult situations. Uh, yesterday I was in a psychiatric ward. Um, the pressure is huge, new patients being admitted, not enough beds. Um, patients have to be uh, discharged in order to make a space. Um, and the traditional hierarchy in a ward of you know, consultant, staff psychiatrist, senior nurse, the, you know, uh, nursing assistants, or all of that um, gets overturned and everybody does what they have to do when it's necessary. And they were a team that were really um, positive, they were constructive, they were well integrated, and the stories they were describing were horrific of self-harm, pa patients self-harming in front of them. Um, but I also uh, heard that the team alongside them, which was the, um, um, the, um, the home care team who dealt with discharge, the bed management team that was responsible for assessment, seemed to me to be c working in different universes. I com un unconnected, other than we need a bed, provide one. Uh, and, and, and the failure to do so, of course, then sets off a whole set of other um, uh, um, poor uh, relationships. I asked them, do they ever get together for a drink? Uh, <laughs> they thought I was crazy. Uh, <coughs> um, um, working from the bottom up, of course, is is um, uh, certainly a a a, um, a widely thought of beneficial way of structuring the um, um, the, the work design as well as the changes that need to be made f that need to be made from time to time because circumstances change, the outside world is changing, and the internal structures need to be. And, and need to mirror the, the changes taking place outside. So uh, the, uh, can I link that point to the one about um, how to bridge the bits of the organization? Because there are um, s ways, there are methods of bringing uh, the different parts of the organization together. Um, they, they, they have technical names, future search conferences, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, 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 whole, system, uh, uh, whole system inquiry technology. There are ways of uh, inviting the different groups to do pieces of work, to do thinking work on their circumstances, on their ideas, on their hopes, and then to nominate one or two or three individuals to go to an overarching meeting where other groups will have sent their representatives to think about the whole system. Uh, these are very pr uh, productive and, uh, ways of um, cutting across the hierarchy by introducing something of a matrix system. Um, action learning, I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, action learning sets which go on, uh, which happen, uh, say, monthly for 12 months or so. Uh, these have ripple effects uh, uh, in the organization. Uh, I've worked with a police force um, in the southwest of England. 
uh, that needed, um, uh, they, they were going through huge changes, both from the, the, um, the home office as well as you know, the demographics in, in, in the county they were working in. And we ran uh, action learning sets. We thought it wouldn't work with police because they really are a can-do organization. They're not used to sitting around and talking much. And, um, but it worked. It absolutely, and they had a thirst, actually, we discovered, to, to have an opportunity in an, uh, without their hierarchy looking over their shoulders, just to talk about what the work was like. And the kind of tricks they get up to, uh, you know, the bottom-up type of thing, which sometimes are subversive. I, you know, like, for instance, uh, patrol cars. Um, you know, there's a system where, uh, that is somewhere in the control room at headquarters, you can see where every patrol car is on your screen. So the, 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 the police on the beat learned that if you put your radios under the seat, it didn't send a signal uh, to, to, um, and they wouldn't know where you are. So, so th they, they enjoyed you know, needling the system, it, uh, subverting it in some way. Um, uh, so, uh, final point, um, being creative uh, and finding your way around the system. Well, that was an example of it. Um, uh, universities, uh, um, uh, you know, where, where the primary task has got s uh, of giving students the opportunity for um, exploration, discovery, learning, has got subverted by some sort of, you know, monetary goal. Um, th that's, that is, well, it's the, the university administrators will say that's the new li new order. We have to submit to that, uh, but it's also sad. Um, the the idea of of um, representative democracy, you know, where things are done on your behalf as a voter or a taxpayer. Yeah, we we live in a world where others, uh, uh, you know, the structure is that others will make decisions um, for us and we have to abide by them whether we agree or not. Um, but some of the dynamics that I think we are experiencing at this time is the fact that shortly there will be an election. And it's unusual for those dynamics to be so obvious two years before an election, but I think it's got something to do with the fact that we have a coalition government. And so each, um, you know, so, their, their anxieties about re being re-elected are beginning to surface now much earlier than usual. And, um, but that's, that's the system we have and we have to... Well, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> 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 On that note... <laughs> <laughs>